Okay. Good morning. I heard they fought. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you're here, Michael. Good. <laughs> you're going to have to help me with these lights we get to where you had it. I met, Michael had all the lights nice for everybody, and then I messed them up. So, uh, But we're still friends, right, Michael? Mm, yeah, no. borderline. <laughs> Pushing it. Okay. All right. um, before we uh, continue, um, Graham, would you come up and speak? Yes. Uh, it's one of those uh, days again that are sobering and sad. Uh, one of our members, uh, who would often sit around about there, uh, Desmona Taylor, passed away this week. Um, Desmona, of course, uh, Bernard's here, his sister-in-law, the uh, sister-in-law of um, Nolan. Um, uh, not too many details yet. There are no service details, Bernard? No, that, that will be uh, some time away. Some time away, yeah. For the grandchildren to be able to get back. <coughs> yeah. Andrew's yeah. Um, I'll just say this word, Desmono. Um, uh, if ever there was a, somebody who deserved sainthood for hospitality and service and caring for people, uh, it was Desmona, and she will be missed. Thank you. That, that does just show you the uncertainty of life and um, bring sadness to us as well. And I know she's been a very faithful member of our, our class from very early on. Yeah, so anyway, I know she'll be missed by, by many. Uh, next week, uh, I'm back on, so you get me. And I'm going to speak on that second part of uh, Brinsma regarding uh, God, and I'm not going to touch on theodicy, but some of the other issues, uh, theological issues. So I'm back on next week. Uh, this week, we're continuing with our book on by Reinder Grinsma. And we're going to have a, a new, well, it's not a new face, I, <laughs> but a new person is going to be speaking to us. He didn't want me to give a lengthy introduction because he said one time he gave him, or someone gave him a very nice introduction. He got up and he said, I don't even recognize who this person is. So, uh, Paul Herman. Paul is here at uh, the University of Pathology. You also have a degree from Stanford. And what was that in? A pathology as well? Physical chemistry. Physical chemistry. Oh, my God. I remember PCAM way back. <laughs> I think it took me. I didn't take it. <laughs> but anyway, but he's also an MD. And I did chat with him just a little bit. I knew his grandfather, WGC Murdoch, uh, who was the only person that I knew that could speak without moving his lips. <laughs> Great man. I, I went to Andrews, uh, didn't know I could get in the seminary or not. And, and of course, he was the dean. And he said, well, I came in, well, laddie. <laughs> and he did use the word laddie, I remember that. He said, you'll have to make up your Greek. And he was even willing to help me with it. So uh, I remember him being a very gracious individual. So at this time, without any further ado, I'm going to have prayer, and then I'm going to turn this over to Paul Herman. Again, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be with us and be with Paul in a very special way as we talk about the leap of faith. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, so those of you who've not heard me lecture before, I usually start off with a really short little vignette that's tangentially related to the topic at best. And there's three reasons for this. The first is you get used to my quirks and speaking style. The second is I learn to read your feedback. And the third is if it goes extremely badly, I get to start over and take another run at it on the main topic. <laughs> So as I was preparing this lesson, I was actually in Charleston, in South Carolina, on a business meeting. And uh, as I was uh, 
sitting there looking around the city, I noticed a lot of things. It's a very pretty city with the shady lanes, cobbled streets, a lot of church steeples, and hence it's been called the holy city for probably <coughs> over 200 years. As I wandered around, though, there was a part of this aspect of the, quote, holy city that I really had a lot of discomfort with, and that is Charleston uh, was a land of deep injustice during the slave trade. It's estimated that 50% of the people imported from Africa into North America for slavery came through the port of Charleston. And this is the indoor slave market that was built in the 1830s because I guess they would call them the town fathers. It sounds a little more like the town tyrants thought that this really didn't belong on the streets of the city out where everybody could see it uh, with the name of the holy city. And everywhere you go, you see reminders of this um, evil trade. You have these beautiful lanes with the oak trees, Spanish moss, and then in the background you see the slave cabins that uh, dotted the path. In a land of injustice like that, and in a land with a lot of religion, both Christian as well as the faiths that came with the people who were being enslaved, uh, you can imagine a situation where there's a desire for some sense of justice. And there's nothing in the human spirit that speaks to unrequited justice quite like a ghost. And so Charleston has a long tradition of being a city with a lot of ghosts. It has great graveyards for ghosts. Um, I mean, imagine walking by that on Halloween. My guess is the kids take a pretty big swath around it on that city block. And you see signs of that superstition everywhere, including the ceilings of the porches in the manor houses. If you look up underneath here, you'll see that this uh, ceiling has a blue color to it that comes from an indigo-based paint. And it was known as haint blue, which is a local dialect for haunt blue. And the idea is the ghosts wouldn't pass under this blue uh, ceiling. So we have a land of ghosts, a land of haint blue porches to protect people from them. And in that graveyard that I showed you, that in my mind is just the epitome of the perfect graveyard, I found this sign. The only ghost at St. Philip's is the Holy Ghost. Join us for worship Sundays and learn about the Trinity, including the Holy Ghost. And that brings me to today's topic, because I think as you'll see when we work through the lesson, this really is somewhat of a study of the Holy Spirit. What I'd like to do is fairly briefly outline the chapter that I'm going to assume, naively or non-naively, that you have all read. Uh, the leap of faith within Grinsma's book. He divides this chapter into seven sections. The uh, punctuation is his. So he starts a section asking, what is doubt? Followed pretty quickly by a section titled, is doubt sin? And then a section that's a combination of discovering and rediscovering faith in God. He then asks the question, is there a basis for faith in God? talks about faith beyond reason, asks if there's a God we can believe in, and finally uh, attempts to answer that with a section titled, Can God Be Found? So I will briefly go through each of these sections. In the section on what is doubt, he talks about a lot of common misconceptions regarding doubt. And these misconceptions he points out, uh, these are the main ones. He believes that it is a misconception to believe that doubt is wrong and identical to unbelief. He also believes it is a misconception that doubt is only associated with faith and not with knowledge in general. And he gives some examples that are reasonably convincing. And then uh, the third misconception that he lists is he believes that doubt is something to be, sorry, <laughs> he believes it is a misconception that doubt is something to be ashamed of and that it is dishonest to stay in the church even if you have your doubts. So within that first section on what is doubt, he turns to some examples of some famous doubters. And actually, this would be one of the very few criticisms I would have of Dr. Brunsma's book, and that is he seems to rest an awful lot on the authority of various figures. I mean, it's a famous person, 
they've made a statement and he seems to accept that statement, which uh, I find a little bit uh, tough to embrace. But he talks about three main famous doubters, Teresa of Lisieux, Martin Luther, Mother Teresa, and then closes the section with some notable quotes on doubt by Paul Tillich, Alfred Lord Tennyson, Isaac Mashiva Singer. <coughs> Now there's one of these I will comment on very briefly further because um, it impacted my life somewhat. So when I was in high school, down at the academy here, they allowed us to take our senior year a college English class at La Sierra University. We had a teacher who came and it was going to be a writing class. And we had a textbook that was a series of short stories by very famous short story authors, in, uh, mostly American literature. The idea was you would read your way through this book and you would practice writing and I think it was hoped that by comparing what you wrote to what you were reading that your writing would improve. So at the beginning of the class we sat down and the teacher went through the table of contents with a list of all the stories that had to be read and we were to place a star next to it because we owned the book and we had to make sure that all those stories were read by the end of the quarter. There was one story in that book by a person named Isaac Bashiva Singer named Gimple the Fool, and I think because the teacher was in a Seventh-day Adventist Academy affiliated with the Seventh-day Adventist College, she told us the only thing that she possibly could tell us about it. She said under no circumstances was anybody to read that story. It was an unacceptable story, it dealt with issues we shouldn't be dealing with, and we were not to look at it. I would venture to guess it's the only story that every kid in that class actually managed to read. So it has uh, caused me a lot of thought through the years. I've reread it a few times. I won't spoil it for anybody who would like to read it, um, although I can't officially recommend it. <laughs> but I will tell you that it is an enigmatic story. It deals with doubt and faith on a very core level. You can read it multiple times with multiple thoughts. I'll get to you in just a second. Um, and I will point out that every year there is a conference in New York where they attempt to determine what the meaning of the story is. So anybody who's looking for something kind of interesting to dig into uh, might be worth a read. Yes, Dr. Kale. What's the title? Gimple the Fool. That's right. By he's, Isaac Bashir. Gimple the Fool. No, 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 I'm sorry. This is uh, Isaac Bashir the Singer. Yeah. Uh, received the Nobel Prize in Literature, the most famous story that was translated, he wrote in Yiddish, so the most famous story translated in English is Gimple the Fool. So, if you Google Gimple the Fool, it will pop up. If you Google Isaac Bashiva Singer, it will be pretty near the top of the list as well. Anyway, moving along, the next section asked the question of whether doubt was sin or not, and uh, Brinsma sort of gave both sides of this argument. He had some examples suggesting that it was sin, uh, looking at the story of Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, pointing out that she doubted, and the story follows that evil entered uh, otherwise pristine environment, and then uh, points out some Ellen White writings that suggest that doubt uh, is linked somewhat directly to sin. He then points out some pretty nifty examples that doubt alone is not sin, that maybe it's more in the realm of temptation. He gives examples of John the Baptist doubting Christ's divinity, sending his disciples to see if he's truly the one to follow or not. Um, he points out that Thomas, who we always call Doubting Thomas, but Thomas' request for evidence was actually granted. Uh, talks about Abraham and Sarah, Zechariah, Job, we could add others like Gideon. But the bottom line is there are examples that kind of go both ways with regard to uh, doubt and sin as to whether they are the same or different entities. Personally, uh, I do not think that they are the same thing, but um, that's somewhat up to the judgment of the reader. The next section that Brunsma goes into is uh, labeled discovering or rediscovering a faith in God. Talks about the fact that faith requires what has been called a big leap. And really, this is the crux of the chapter, kind of the most valuable part, because it purports to be a how-to manual to gain faith. And this is actually kind of a tricky thing. I took a religion class uh, in college at Andrews. It was on the New Testament. And uh, at the time, I will admit, it wasn't um, probably my closest personal walk with the Lord. 
And I was kind of curious about people who felt a strong faith, how they got it. And so we would be sitting in class, and I asked the teacher, I think, every which way I could possibly think of, how does one gain faith? And in all cases, I was either told, oh, we'll be getting to that, or, well, when you get there, you'll know. When I got to the end of the class, to when we got into that part of the class, he said, now, of course, we've already covered this because of Paul's questions, and we'll be moving on. So it, it truly is a tricky step to take, and uh, we can explain why as we go farther. But Prunsma recommends if you're interested in faith, begin the journey by assuming faith. Uh, focus on the part that might be faith and try to avoid the parts that are doubts. Uh, he points out a lot of practical advantages, uh, stating that living with belief he believes to be more fruitful for living in the current world uh, than a program of skepticism is. And actually, not to give away too much, but that's kind of the Gimple the Fool story to some extent. He suggests people taking a hypothetical belief. In other words, let's assume that I have belief and see where it leads. Uh, suggest people place themselves in an environment where faith is practiced, spending some of their time in weekends in, uh, in church and the like. Suggest people submerge themselves in a language of faith through prayer or joining groups of people who pray, reading the Bible, attending the church. But then he gets to the point that I really think is the bottom line, and we'll be talking about this a lot more later, and that is faith is actually a gift of the Holy Spirit. And so to sit and constantly attempt to attain it on one's own, uh, I don't believe is a highly productive exercise. Within this same section, he deals with some counter-arguments, uh, which he then uh, contradicts. So he points out counter-arguments to wanting faith. Some consider faith to be a leap in the dark. He points out Sigmund Freud did not consider it as a particularly lofty uh, mental exercise. Basically, kind of paints a paper tiger and then destroys it in the sense that these aren't fully fleshed out. Uh, but then the answer he gives is he just doesn't, he considers them to be opinions, not really resting in any serious evidence, and uh, points out that it's always convenient to have untestable theories. So, again, this is an area that not sure really added too much to the book. He at least acknowledged the fact that there were uh, other views with regard to faith, but. Um, I wouldn't use this section um, as a uh, apologetic work with regard to a non-believer. Uh, the next section asks if there's a basis for faith in, ba in God. He considers the classical proofs unconvincing, um, which I would tend to agree. He introduces a concept of foundationalism, the concept that there are absolute principles, and then divides classic foundationalists who believe in a self-evident truth from modest foundationalists that he claims require a little bit less absolute certainty. So it seems like kind of a subtle distinction, but the idea is you can base things on fundamental principles and build up from them. Uh, points out, uh, from his perspective, something can be viewed as reliable if a reliable method produced it. Uh, again, not arguing for or against it, just saying these are some of the things he went through. Uh, he suggests that one could have a whole series of individually weak beliefs, but when you put them all together, they would form a web, like a cable or a spider web, that would give some strength to faith. Um, he's not convinced that just because faith would sort of land in the realm some would call wishful thinking, that it should be discredited as a valid thing. And uh, finally, suggests that a designer god probably gave us an inbuilt um, desire to believe. Again, as you move through it, it, it kind of moves back in that direction toward faith is a gift. And that I very much appreciate. <coughs> um, talks about, in a section called Faith Beyond Reason, he classifies faiths in terms of what he considers to be unwholesome and faith that he, faith that he considers to be beneficial. So the unwholesome faith is uh, his suggestion that if one finds themselves in a situation where the faith is, faith is depressing them, boxing them in, causing some sort of fear, or engendering an obnoxious arrogance or intolerance, it's probably not wholesome faith, not worth pursuing. But if one finds their faith journey liberating, building people up, and leading to growth, then uh, they are probably on the right track. Within this section, he has some examples and notes, which is a little bit of a miscellaneous collection of concepts that 
felt like maybe he couldn't fit them in other parts of the chapter. But he points out um, people can have faith based on past experience. So if I've driven over a bridge 50 times and now I'm driving that road in the fog, my past experience would give me a faith that there would still be a bridge there. Uh, states that faith can be determined from things that I maybe have experienced at a distance a little bit. So he said, seen plenty of pictures of the North Pole, never been there, but certainly believes that a North Pole exists. Um, he moves out a little bit farther and talks about one could derive faith from evidence presented by others. Um, he considers the Faith is a psychological normal, psychologically normal state. Uh, it does not consider faith to equate entirely with intellectual acceptance. And uh, I, I think that particularly makes a lot of sense when you look at most of the Old Testament heroes had a time when they weren't willing to entirely accept their relationship with the Lord. And yet, uh, from the Christian perspective, they had great faith. Um, mentions that reason is important. But in his words, but why should we trust only one of our faculties when we have many others? And then uh, ends by pointing out nobody has produced a convincing argument for the non-existence of God. Uh, it, neither has anyone come up with an entirely convincing argument for the existence of God. But in his mind, the, these make them sort of faith, non-faith on kind of an equivalent playing field, if you will. Uh, he then moves into uh, talking about a God that we can believe in, and he starts to get down to the root of what the Christian faith is. points out that people have accused Protestants of worshiping a book rather than a person, and that uh, ties into the fact that Protestantism grew up largely as the Bible became printed, and particularly as it became written in the common languages. And i got to take a brief interlude. When I was in Academy, I worked at the press. And over the door of the press, there was a poster that hung. And I have yet to be any, in any press shop that doesn't have a copy of this hung on the wall. And so I'm going to show it to you in a second. But let's read it in the context of exactly what's being worshipped here. And I think it will illustrate what may be meant by worshipping a book rather than a God. So, this hangs in a printing office. This is a printing office. Crossroads of civilization. Refuge of all the arts against the ravages of time. Armory of fearless truth against whispering rumor. Incessant trumpet of trade. From this place words may fly abroad. Not to perish on waves of sound. Not to vary from the writer's hand, but fixed in time having been verified in proof. Friend, you stand on sacred ground. This is a printing office. <laughs> so apparently this was written in 1932 when the first guy printed it and the next guy saw it. And so there's a ton of different typesets because every printer in the world in the English speaking arena really likes this because it gives a lot of credence to what they do. But when you look at it, it kind of illustrates the idea of what exactly one is worshiping or caring about. The printing office has value because of all the things listed in there. But in the end, the author of this is saying, you stand on sacred ground, this is a printing office, right? I mean, it, it, what exactly is a value here, the office or what it produces? So likewise, with regard to the Protestant look at the Bible, what's a value, the book and the fact that it's in English or what you can read within it that has value? He then points to uh, Roman Catholicism as committing a different mistake, uh, making the church the focus of the faith, so expecting uh, church dogma, church um, authority to um, sort of affect one's faith. And Brunsma's thesis is genuine faith is a person-to-person -person relationship, and again, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, he kind of closes out the section talking about, you know, how do you deal with the faith of a loving God in an evil world? I mean, they're age-old questions, and uh, mentions that there's no conclusive proof, which I think was... Uh, good and honest. A lot of people who write books like this attempt to convince the world that they have an answer to these questions, but these are very, very tough questions. The real crux of the book, though, from my perspective, rests in this chapter, and it's how to get faith if you want it. And at the very top of that, it, he points out faith is a gift, faith is experiential, it has an element of adventure, 
One should expect the gift and be open to it if presented with it. Prayer certainly helps, but in the end, he keeps coming back to faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and then in the final section, titled God Can Be Found, he leads the exhortation, I urge you, do not abandon your faith. God exists and you can have a personal relationship with him that gives new meaning to your life. Life, If your faith has gradually been eroded or has even disappeared, start looking again for the gift of faith. So that concludes sort of the outline of Brunsman's, uh, Brunsma's uh, look at faith. And now I'll uh, move on a little bit into sort of some additional thoughts that I had. And I'm going to be absolutely clear. I started by typing faith into Wikipedia. I don't know how many of you do that, but one can drift for hours through that fantastic entity. Because you don't have to look things up alphabetically. They have the little blue and you just click on the things you find interesting and you can drift aimlessly for a long time. But what I found in there were a couple of things, and this one uh, I put in particularly for Dr. Stacy, because it deals with the uh, so sociological, psychological aspects. Uh, James Fowler, who apparently was a student of Piaget, came up with a series of stages for faith. Um, as I read through them, I recognized that as my life unfolded, certain of these did resonate with various uh, parts of my life. Not sure these really speak to a particularly Christian faith as opposed to faith in general. But it does suggest that as a person grows, faith also grows. So while Brunsma's chapter is focused around the gift of faith, the initial receipt of faith, I think it is worth recognizing that one can grow in whatever faith that they have uh, been granted. So that's sort of uh, the faith journey from a psychological perspective, but I thought it might be kind of fun to look at faith um, from more of a, a book perspective. So uh, in that same Wikipedia article, it talked about the etymology of the word faith. So I've listed basically what they did, but it's how faith came to the English language. It was first used in English between 1200 and 1250. At that point came from the Middle English word, which I presume is pronounced pretty similarly to faith, but I don't know that for a fact, which came from the Anglo-French fed, the Old French fade or fate, the Latin fidem, and I'm sure I'm butchering all these pronunciations, my apologies, which is uh, ultimately from fidir, or fideria to trust. So I like to collect old books. And since I don't have the wealth of Huntington, I am forced to just stick with facsimiles. And so I have a collection of facsimiles, which drives my wife nuts. She says they're uh, dust collectors and financial drains, but they're really not that expensive, particularly when you compare them to the real work. So one of these books that I have that I just acquired is a facsimile of the Gutenberg Bible. Now, I don't know much about it other than it's from the Vulgate, the Latin translation of the Bible. And I don't know any Latin to speak of, but I can certainly pick out this word F-I-B-E-S that we saw on the last slide. Another one of the facsimiles I have is the Wycliffe Bible, which was translated from this Latin Vulgate into English between 1382-1395. And what's interesting is you can see from the last slide that Latin F-I-D-E-S, fides, and then the uh, um, Old English faith, F-E-I-T-H. So, but faith is the substance of thingies that been to be hoped in an argument of thingies not appearing. Sounds a little bit familiar, uh, even to the, those of us who probably never opened a Wycliffe Bible. We need to talk a little bit about Protestantism and uh, its particular focus on Scripture. Protestants have placed great weight on the concept of clarity of Scripture. So Luther uh, believed that people needed to be able to read the Bible and understand it, go back directly to the source, so wipe away all the uh, sort of ritual and tradition that had grown up and consequently translated the Bible into German, had tremendous impact on Germany in many ways and certainly on Protestantism. Uh, Arminius wrote an uh, article, I guess you'd call it, The Perspicuity of Scriptures. This is uh, another word, I believe, for clarity or something very close to it. And it turns out this is the predominant theology 
in the Methodist faith that came via Wesley, because Wesley was uh, very heavily influenced by Arminius. Of the Protestants, there was only one that um, took a little bit different tack that I came across, and that was Calvin. So he believed there was value in reading the scripture, but he believed that human nature was so depraved that it required the Holy Spirit to illuminate what was being read, where Luther and Arminius um, don't seem to make quite that distinction. This Protestant view is very much in contrast with Augustine, and this is a quote from one of Augustine's works that said that he, Augustine, should not believe the gospel except as moved by the authority of the Catholic Church. And so you start to see this divide uh, between church as authoritative versus book as authoritative, and it gets back to Brunsman's earlier um, discussion. <clears throat> like any road, there's a ditch on either side of this. Protestants were very, very focused on the, you know, how do you attain salvation? What do you do with the balance between authority and actual scripture? Led to many huge fights, literally, some civil wars. But in 1646, a group of members from Parliament, as well as the English church clergy and some Scots got together to try and come up with how to make sense of the whole thing. And so they uh, issued a statement that is also labeled perspicuity of the scripture or clarity of the scripture. And this is a quote from it. Those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in due use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. This is a really big piece of our faith. It is the backbone of American Protestant theology in general, and I would certainly uh, consider Adventism to be in that um, tradition. Because of this mindset, which had been going on for many, many years prior to this conference, there was an increasing dem demand for Bibles in the English vernacular. So we already talked about Wycliffe having translated from the Vulgate based on the uh, phrase in the last slide that it had to be so clear somewhere in scripture that one could get salvation from it, there was an increasing demand from Protestants for translations into English from the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic. And I got a lot of help here from Dr. Taylor. And if I get it wrong, Dr. Taylor, my apologies, I'm doing my best. Um, but there are sort of two lineages to the English uh, translations. One would be called the oppositional lineage, um, and this includes the Tyndall translation and something called the Geneva Bible. Both of these were done under pain of death. Publication was done off-site because it, you know, you could get in trouble for even printing this stuff. And uh, the actual text isn't so much objectionable as in the footnotes and the little uh, paraphrases along the side and the glosses they've made very clear that there's problems with the concept of a monarchy. There's problems with an ecclesiast or a, sorry, Episcopalian church hierarchy. They're much more in the Presbyterian, that it needs to be a little bit more ground up rather than top down. Because this was floating around, and as usual, you can't entirely destroy your opposition, there became sort of an officially sanctioned lineage of uh, English Bibles starting with the Great Bible, which influenced the Bishop's Bible, which ultimately is the forerunner of the one that most of us are familiar with, the King James Version, which incidentally, the 1611 version, to me, doesn't look a whole lot different than um, more modern ones. There's no getting around the fact these two groups influenced each other. I don't know Dr. Taylor, but I would venture to guess some of the same people may have been translating in both camps, but I don't know if that's true. It's just, it, it appears that there, to me, that there's an awful lot of crosstalk from what uh, I read. So, uh, let's take a quick look. I don't speak any Greek. Um, this is a huge handicap. My grandfather attempted to teach me Greek. It was a mutual arrangement, but what became clear very quickly is the grandfather-grandson relationship is very different than the teacher-student relationship, and it kind of fell apart. I mean, the teacher-student fell apart. So um, I'm forced to do kind of a translation by number. And so I have an interlinear Bible that has the words in Greek and Hebrew, and they're numbered, and one can look up the number. And so there's a Greek word 
um, pistis, which comes from an earlier root that, according to my Greek English dictionary, means persuasion, credence, uh, conviction. Uh, and then it gets into of a religious truth, truthfulness of God, religious teacher, reliance upon Christ for salvation. But what I see in this definition is a very Christian view of this word. And the word actually goes back long before the New Testament, if I understand correctly. So um, it's, you get the sense that the meaning of the word may have shifted a little bit over time, which is not unusual. We see that in English as well. I always like to give an awful example. Over time, language changes. We take the word awful. Currently, it's an adjective, very bad or unpleasant, things like disgusting, nasty, terrible extremely shocking or horrific, synonyms like serious, grave, bad, terrible, dreadful, and only when we look archaic do we realize that it's inspiring a reverential wonder or fear, so more in the religious realm. And I would venture to say that I've, uh, even though the use and meaning of the word has shifted from the archaic to the more modern, where we don't necessarily think of awful as having any religious connection, the religious connection is still there, in my opinion. Awful, something is awful, packs way more punch than horrific, in my opinion. It has more of a religious sort of, it's awfully bad. And I mean, when I was in graduate school, people would pair this word with words for deities that, you know, really packed a lot of punch when something like my dissertation wasn't written correctly. But be that as it may, um, because language has shifted and because that Greek dictionary suggested that there might be uh, an earlier root to it, when you look up that earlier root, it has more of a sense of convince, pacify, conciliate, assent. You get, you get the sense that there's a little bit of a more of an argumentation, debate, convince me kind of aspect as, a, as opposed to something that is just sort of a standard statement, I have faith. So let's uh, um, look briefly at the Greek-based uh, translation lineages. So this is the uh, interlinear Bible that um, I've been using. And it's basically the word order is a little different. And again, Dr. Taylor helped me recognize the, the grammar here is everything. And I know nothing about it. So kind of all I have is the word order is now faith. And it's that word that has, from my perspective, a lot of nuanced meaning is now faith of things being hoped, substance of things, evidence not being seen. And so we'll take a quick look here at the uh, uh, Tyndall edition. And it's kind of neat. This is a picture from the page. So, you know, faith is a sure confidence of things which are hoped for and a certainty of things which are not seen. And then it moves on into the next um, text. So that's the Tyndall version. We can look at the Geneva Bible. Now faith is the ground of things which are hoped for and the evidence of things which are not seen. And we finally come to the version I think most of us are pretty familiar with. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And we can go further, King James Version, New International Version. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And the Revised Standard, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. And what I would posit is that in spite of all attempts by the translators in English to look back directly to the Greek, it appears to me that that first translation from the Latin, based on Thaddeus, placed a pretty strong stamp on the English understanding of what faith is. And so we're handicapped somewhat um, by the language that we're born into. And so we come back around to kind of close off with more of a practical look, how do we get faith? And I would uh, hope that everybody remembers the text talking about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterances of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. 
to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. And there's a couple of things here that I think are worth highlighting. And that is, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given the Spirit of utterances. To another, the utterance of knowledge. To another, faith by the same Spirit. And all are given by the Spirit who allots to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. And so, I would point to these points for everyone to ponder. I'm not convinced everyone who's a Christian is given the gift of faith equally. There's a lot of meaning to being a Christian. There are people who follow Christ's example with no thought of an afterlife. There are people who view their Christianity as a personal, close relationship with the Lord. I would posit that both are practicing Christianity in an important manner based upon the gifts they've been given. So not everyone's given the gift of faith equally. Christians have different gifts that they've been given. Some are more in the pragmatic realm, healing miracles. Some are more in the theological realm, knowledge and wisdom. And finally, I would suggest people ponder, it doesn't appear to me that receiving the gift of faith implies that there will never ever be any doubt in the person's mind. And so finally, in conclusion, these would be my two points. If you've been given a large helping of the gift of faith, use it to the glory of God and enjoy it. Gifts are to be enjoyed. If you haven't been given a large helping of the gift of faith, take heart. Because 1 Corinthians that talks about that gift of faith closes chapter 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But notice, the greatest of these is love. And finally, 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers a multitude of sins. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I, uh, I do want to mention that, that this is a family uh, presentation here today. Your folks are here. I am. My <laughs> wife and my son, so you know, it's a bit of a rocky run. <laughs> there are also some other relatives. Now you can us. say, well, they're not all right. <laughs> and uh, appreciate uh, the whole family being there. Actually, sometimes that's the hardest time to make a presentation is when they're all, when they're all around. To me, the hardest part was going back and preaching at a church that knew me when I was young. Yes. <laughs> so anyway, we want to welcome the whole family as well. So uh, at this time, we're going to do questions and sure. truck around with this mic. All right. Thank you. I find comfort in your last three slides because there are a lot of Christians that hold up their own faith experience as normative for everyone else. And what you said in the next to the last slide is, that ain't necessarily so. Thank you. I take comfort along the same lines. Uh, we've all been to the um, sort of evangelistic series, and the person tells you what it's going to be like. You know, that religion class I referred to in college, where they told me, well, you know, when you have faith, you'll know it, because this, this, and this will happen. I do happen to have a faith, but not everything that I was told would happen did happen. This helps one sort of let go of that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. With regard to Adam and Eve in particular, which came first? A sinful nature, uh, which gives us the ability to doubt, or the reverse? If so, did the Creator make an error in, cre in doing creation that allow us to be born with uh, the ability to doubt, thereby sin, or is it? Doubt simply a process by which we can reflect, <laughs> learn, unlearn, uh, get leading to God, and hopefully become, you know, have more faith at the end. You know, the question you ask is pretty deep and profound, and what you suggest in it is actually very, very valuable to focus on. I'm going to state right off the top, I don't know the answer to your question. 
there may be some other people in the room that are more equipped to actually answer it than I am. My thoughts regarding it, though, are I think you've raised the fact that humans have been given a whole lot of gifts. Faith is one, and then there's the gifts of the Spirit that we go through. But that ability to think and to reason, and that ability to have free choice and not have to automatically follow, are huge. I don't know the answer to whether doubt is sin, or doubt is a temptation, or doubt is part of that thought process that I very much appreciate our Maker having given to us. But whatever it is, it's in a pretty profound region of the human experience. And I really don't know what else to say other than I appreciate the fact that you brought up that uh, point in those thoughts. Thank you. There wouldn't be a lesson without Dr. Brown's take. Get the man the mic. He doesn't, he doesn't need a mic. I know. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Herman. This has been a, a, a great overview of the chapter, and you've brought it together in your last few slides with great helpfulness for me. Um, in the middle of your presentation, you, you referred to experiential uh, element in faith. But you didn't develop that very much. You left that alone. And it's, for much of my Christian life, that has been a challenge to understand. You can't read much Christian history without being impressed by the actual experience of people that we call now saints. Whether it was Francis of Assisi, or Joan of Arc, and uh, quite a lot of others too who have achieved a certain amount of notoriety in the history of the church and their own personal record of what they experienced is hard to dismiss that's what they said experienced in them and if you come down if you've read much about George Whitfield or John Wesley uh, Jonathan Edwards, in our own uh, fairly recent history, the, some of the leaders of, uh, of Christian faith have built that unique faith on personal experience. I wish you had said more about that. <laughs> For me, I have to say, uh, I was out of medical school and Still in this frame of mind of openness and wondering, I read the autobiography of Charles G. Finney, the great early 19th century evangelist in New England. And it was his own personal experience with God through the Holy Spirit, undoubtedly, uh, recorded in his own words. It was an autobiography that convinced me that we neglect experience as a legitimate contribution to faith. And experience comes to us, I think, in considerable measure, uh, in, uh, in as much as we search for it. Mm -hmm. So let us not just express faith only as a gift. That suggests a passivity that we're waiting until God somehow lands it upon us. That's not what happened to me. And I've continued to search for it. Okay. That is a very valid point. Um, the experiential aspect of one's religion is a very big part of it. Very different, very unique. Um, I've often been very envious of Paul, his Damascus Road experience. You know, there being no ambiguity. Um, I've not experienced that. However, in my life, I've experienced a number of things that uh, came together in ways that in retrospect would suggest the Lord was leading. I think both are experiences of the Christian walk. Um, 
but different people respond to different things differently. And uh, so for some, that Damascus Road experience was given to them. They've embraced it. They've very much enjoyed it. I don't know. I've always wanted one, but there's a part of me that suspects it would terrify me as well. So um, I think the Lord gives us what we can handle. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Um, that, that was great. Um, having, having retired from doing some administrative stuff, we used to facetiously say sometimes that there was a difference between constructive criticism and destructive criticism. And of course, the tongue-in-cheek answer to that is um, constructive criticism is when I criticise you <laughs> and destructive <laughs> criticism is when you criticise me. And I wonder if the same couldn't be applied with this doubt a little bit. You know, there's, maybe there's some constructive one and there's some destructive one. And maybe it's, it's as simple as... Uh, uh, we get upset when, or people get upset with us if we question that which has been established or that which is precious to some others. Um, so I, I like the way you pull those two things together. And I, I don't have a question, maybe, but a, a, and the comment. But I would say there'd be few thoughtful Christian leaders, few moral change agents, few reformers, if there weren't doubters. So maybe, I know the word has been captured, hasn't it? Um, has been captured and given a negative. It's a bit like, are you a conservative or a liberal? So the, the, the words have been captured by the others and, and attributed the meaning by the good or bad. And, and I think doubt's one of those ones, whereas I, I think it's just a, a process to help some of us get from the, from our history or get from our present to a sort of a future understanding and therefore it becomes benign and it's, it's not evil or good in and of itself. Uh-oh. <laughs> I hope I was close, Dr. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, I uh, really enjoyed this. I'd like to go in a somewhat different um, direction although you may feel that the direction I go every week is the same. But some years back, uh, when teaching my Greek students, uh, I, we were talking about the subjunctive, which some of the students had never heard of. One of them went on the internet and came up with a TED talk by a, a Vietnamese called The Dark Side of the Subjunctive. And it's a fascinating talk. Uh, it had, for me, it changed entirely my view of language because we are born with a set of tools with which to think, which includes the subjunctive, which is the mood of contingency. That is to say, what might or might not happen. In Vietnamese, there is no such capacity you can't wonder what might have happened. There are no tools to do that. And there are, the, well, there are no tools in the, in the structure of the language. You don't have that concept, that capacity. It is, simply is what it is. And we have been given a set of tools, and the subjunctive today is for most people, the normal language. In fact, the deeper into, um, into language and, and expression in the current culture goes, the more dependent on the subjunctive we are, because it is not intended to provide absolute answers. It gives us the tools to discuss the indicative and to, to question and to think and to reason. I, and I urge, if you haven't, to take a look at that. Uh, his was a, a, he was one of the, uh, those who escaped from Vietnam and the tragic circumstance was averted because he cried so extensively that they skipped the bus to the airport. And the rest of his life was working that through, but his father never had the capacity to discuss it. So what we, 
Doubt is only possible because we have the subjunctive. And faith is also tied into that. And we doubt because of that capacity. If we get rid of doubt, we're left with a very shallow life. That's very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Paul. It's good to have one of our own to make this excellent presentation. Uh, you gave us a lot of food for thought, and uh, I was impressed by your incursion to linguistic and history and grammar and all this together. I am amazed by the fact that uh, uh, two people, let's say two scientists like uh, Stephen Weinberg, Weinberg and Pockinghorn, Weinberg physicist, Pockinghorn physicist and theologian, they're looking at the same facts and came with different conclusions. Weinberg believed that uh, now, with all the scientific discoveries, the intelligent people have the option to just dismiss God's existence. But Pockinghorn believed otherwise. He believed that uh, religion and science, they are compensating each other, and they are going step in step. I like very much uh, Galileo Galilei's aphorism, summarizing this, and when he said, uh, the science uh, show us uh, how the heavens go, but the Bible show us how to go to heaven. Now, about uh, God's existent argument, about uh, our faith. I, uh, I like very much uh, an argument which is called Kalam argument. I don't know if you are acquainted with this. Uh, it's used in uh, scientific circles, it was used also by writing dissertations uh, starting with this. It's based on three main arguments. The first one is that everything that exists has a cause. The second one is that the universe has a beginning, and the third one, because it has a beginning, then has a cause. Then. Uh, of course, uh, we can find, uh, looking at uh, the same things, we can find different arguments. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have to be very careful and uh, evaluate the data that is in front of us and uh, uh, try to, to be as sincere as possible in uh, the conclusions that we reach. I would agree entirely. It's occurred to me that miracles many times are in the eye of the beholder. There are people, you know, the same event can happen to a person. The believer will see the hand of God. The non-believer will come up with a reason there was no hand of God. It seems to me to rest somewhat in one's assumptions, which makes a lot of sense. If the God that we worship is the God that we describe, and certainly wouldn't be provable from other fundamental principles. I mean, you would have to be among them, part of the sort of assumptions, so to speak. But as I was studying through this, you know, I had always kind of wondered about that aspect that, you know, you see what you're sort of looking for, you're seeing what you anticipate to you see, you're sort of built around the assumptions that you make the sort of fundamental principles these big things rest on. But I don't know why. It had never really occurred to me until I got into this book and studied this a little more deeply, the gift aspect of faith. In my mind, that is huge. It makes a lot of sense and it brings a lot of things into place. Because when you get down to trying to figure out your fundamental philosophical assumptions, you can build a worldview that rests on a set of assumptions with God. You can build a worldview that rests on a set of assumptions without God. You look at people who are fairly successful in both camps, like the two that you just described in the scientific arena, and in the end, one's a believer, one's not. It makes an awful lot of sense that the Holy Spirit sort of pushes to give that gift. Last question here. I'd like to make just one small uh, contribution to a very important and complex uh, subject, and that is 
We often think that the opposite of faith is doubt, or uncertainty, or perplexity, something like that. But Hebrews 13 suggests that the opposite of faith is none of those, but it's cowardice. By faith he did this, by faith she did that, by faith, it's always uh, something that that person did in the face of great adversity. It's not as though Hebrews 13 is saying, well, okay, these people had faith, now they don't have any doubt anymore. That, it's not an issue of doubt, it's an issue of courage in the face of intense adversity while one's trying to do good. So uh, I think when we think of what faith is, we might try to understand what its contrary is, and then that would give us some understanding what it itself is. And that is a beautiful place to end. I had a religion teacher in college who um, didn't capture the thought you had. It was uh, Joe Lee, I don't know some of you may be familiar with him, but his closing comment at the end of his class on some day Adventist beliefs was, just remember the Christian faith is a call to be bold in the world of the and it fits beautifully with um, I never thought of faith as really a statement that both is Thank you so much for a very instructional and enjoyable presentation. Hopefully the first of many to come. We'll see. <laughs> Alright, for our for our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.